Welcome to our third video on arches, in which we're going to focus on the issue of reducing axial force by increasing the depth of the arch. The depth of the arch, by the way, is usually referred to as the rise of the arch, but we understand it in the same terms that we have used for all other spanning members, which is there is an effective depth. And I sometimes will mix those terms, called calling it the depth of the arch and sometimes the rise of the arch, and I apologize for that. But those terminologies will both be encountered in the literature, so it's probably good for you to get used to them now. In previous videos, we defined the role of the horizontal buttressing force in making the arch behave as a true arch, that is, as a member acting in pure compression without bending. We can visualize the necessity for this buttressing force at the support by the need to get a resultant force that is aligned with the direction of the arch. We learned that the horizontal buttressing force induces a horizontal force of equal magnitude everywhere across this truss. And we know that because every time we create a free body, we see that there are no other horizontal forces except this buttressing force and whatever horizontal force exists on this cut face. So there is always a horizontal force within the arch and it is always equal to the buttressing force H. In the case of Myers Bridge, the horizontal buttressing force at each support is provided by the Rock Mountains. In the case of the Broadgate Exchange House, the buttressing force is provided by the tie member connecting the supports. In this case, the tie member is visible. In the case of the Moscone Center, the buttressing force is provided by post-tension cables connecting the base points of each arch and these cables in this case are hidden below the concrete slab. They were post-tensioned in such a way as to lift the cured concrete structure up off the formwork which supported it while the concrete was green. In this portion of the Washington DC train station the support forces at the ends of the interior arch is being provided by the tubular truss so here we have a tubular truss with two visible faces, and then there's a horizontal face up above, which is just below the decking, which is not visible. The resultant force along the arches here, these interior arches, at the support points is provided by the combined action of the horizontal truss face of the tubular truss. That's the face just below the roof decking right here and the sloped face, which is most visible here, uh, facing in towards the atrium. The sloped truss face of the tubular truss is almost at the correct angle for providing the overall uh, compressive force uh, to support the end of the arch. Whatever additional force is provided by the horizontal portion of this tubular truss and to some degree also by the diaphragm action of the roof decking. This image shows two arches, each spanning the same distance L and supporting the same uniformly distributed load W. At each support point, there is a vertical force that is imposed by the load W in the span L, that force being WL over 2. This force remains the same regardless of the proportions of the arch that we choose. The shallower arch requires a much larger horizontal buttressing force than the deeper arch in order to produce a resultant force that aligns with the center line, with the center line of the arch. In this case, we are using the slope of the arch to infer the slope of this compressive force. And in that process, we're inferring what the length H needs to be. In this case, it's fairly long. In this case, it's fairly short. So we are inferring or estimating the magnitudes of the horizontal buttressing forces through this slope argument. 
Often, however, we do not know the, the precise slope at the end of the arch, and deducing that is more trouble than it's worth. So when we're actually trying to calculate this horizontal force, we have an alternate method that we use. We almost always know the span of the arch because we decided upon that as a part of our design problem. And second of all, we know the depth of the arch because typically we specified that as part of the design process. In which case, we can use moment arguments to deduce the magnitude of the horizontal force. So as a refresher here, we have a vertical support force, V, which is WL over 2. It was a distributed load W for the entire length L or the entire span L of the arch. So the total load on the arch is WL, and then WL over 2 will be the support force at one end of the arch. We also had a distributed force here, W, which was over this half of the arch. So when we multiply W times L over 2, we get the resultant force, which is centered at this half of the original arch, or in other words, it's L over 4 away from that support. So we have two forces here an upward vertical force, a downward force, and a lever arm of L over 4. So the moment of those vertical forces, which is a pure force couple, is going to be the magnitude of one of those forces, which is WL over 2, times the lever arm between the two of them. And when we multiply all this out, we get WL squared over 8. This is a reminder that WL squared over 8 is a universal prescription for the moment of the vertical forces for anything that is spanning a distance L under a uniform load W, assuming it's a simple span, meaning it is supported at the ends and has no overhangs. If this is a fixed number that is fixed by the design situation, in other words, by the spans and the loads. There's also a moment of the horizontal forces. So here we have one horizontal force. There we have the other. They are equal and opposite. So they also form a pure force couple. When we extend the line of action of this H force and the line of that one, we're able to define a lever arm L, which we're calling L sub H, meaning it is the lever arm of the horizontal forces. So the moment of the horizontal forces in magnitude is H times LH. It turns out it's a negative moment by the way in which we typically prescribe it, but we're just describing here the magnitude of that moment. So we can take moments about any point in the universe, and we get a positive moment, WL squared over 8, due to these two vertical forces which are tending to produce clockwise rotation. And I'll just remind you that because they are a, a pure force couple, we have proven that that force produces the same moment about every point in the universe. So when we write this equation, we don't actually have to specify a point because we only have two kinds of influences on this. There's one force couple due to the, v, the vertical forces, another force couple due to the horizontal forces, and there are no other forces on the system that are not incorporated into some kind of a force couple. This is it. Everything can be clustered into force couples. And when we write this equation of the positive moment due to the vertical forces and the negative moment due to the horizontal forces, we add those two together. And that's absolutely every influence that we need to be concerned about on this free body. And that has to be equal to zero which means we can take this HL over to the other side of the equation and make it positive. So we have H, L sub H is equal to WL square over H, over 8. And then we can solve for H by dividing by um, the right side of the equation by the lever arm L sub H. What this says, of course, is if we can double this lever arm, we can cut this horizontal force in a half. Now, let's ask ourselves, what do we, how do we deal with that mathematically? Well, 
first of all, the neat thing here is we said before, when we were looking at the slopes at the end, we said, well, we don't really know what the slope is, but we know, we know the vertical height or the rise of the arch, which is L sub H. We know the load W, we know the span, so we can calculate H precisely from this equation. So in this image, we've superimposed several arches, each one being twice as steep as the other. So here is an arch, the rise of which is the span over 16. Here's an arch, the rise of which is L over H. Here's one where the rise is L over 4. And finally, the rise of this tallest one is L over 2. Now, we've drawn the vertical force here, and the reason we superimposed all these on top of each other is this is the invariant quantity. The total load, W, divided by 2 is the vertical force supporting the end of this arch. What's variable is the height of the arch varies, and when it does, the horizontal uh, force varies. So here we have the force all the way out here that is the equilibrium of this force. And then this, half of that, becomes this equilibrium right here, the equilibrium of this force, and so forth. So what we're doing is we're making the force small, the horizontal force smaller and smaller, and we're depicting that here where we cut it in half, we cut it in half again, and we cut it in half again. So by the time we get to this very tall arch, we have a compressive force that's actually got a very small horizontal component. This process has limiting returns since the overall force in the arch cannot go below the vertical force. In other words, this horizontal force, no matter how high the arch gets, this horizontal force never goes to zero, and therefore this compressive force never goes to less than this vertical force, WL over 2, or capital W over 2. Nonetheless, for the highest arch shown here, the overall force in the arch is very small, which suggests that there is much less material in the cross-section of that arch than would be ca the case for the shallow arches. However, higher arches are longer and therefore more vulnerable to roll through buckling and failure under asymmetric gravity loads or horizontal forces of wind or seismic. Also, the longer the arch becomes, uh, the more material is required to create that arch. So we have these competing effects. That as we make the arch taller under gravity, the axial force diminishes. That means we can do with a thinner cross section or smaller cross section and still keep those stresses under control. But while we're doing that, we're making the arch longer, which is adding to the material. But at some point, we're actually going to have to add material to the cross section because we're going to have wind forces, seismic forces, or some kind of asymmetric gravity load that will require some bending capacity in the curved element. <clears throat> It's very tempting to try to take advantage of the volume of the space occupied by the tension members. So here we have some tension members, and we would just love to get those up out of the way so we can fully appreciate this argument. So one of the things we might be tempted to do is to pull this bottom cord up and create this situation right here, which frees up more volume. And they kind of did this in the structure right here. They didn't put much curvature on the bottom, though, and there's a reason why they didn't do that. Um, basically, you can't cheat the system this way. If you slice through the free body right here, put a compressive force on that point, a tension force in this direction, you'd understand that you haven't accomplished very much because when you pull this bottom cord up, you reduce the lever arm for the action of that tension force and this horizontal compressive force. So we're not really able to do this and derive any benefit from it. And just to prove the point, um, 
to, as a reminder, the worst moment in the truss is at the center of the span. When we take a free body by slicing through at the center of the span, we discover that the effect of pulling up the bottom cord tension member is to reduce the lever arm for the action of the top and bottom cords and generating the internal resisting moment. And this is a multi-frame analysis on this bow truss and then this modified bow truss. We've reduced the lever arm to half and we've doubled the cord forces in the process of doing that. Pulling the tie member halfway up to the top cord shows an even more dramatic increase in the deflection of the bow truss. That ends our discussion of the impact of depth of an arch on the axial force that exists in that arch.